For decades, California has been one of the states with a large homeless population. In recent years, however, the challenges have severely worsened in the Golden State. Between 2014 and 2020, the homelessness point-in-time counts in California rose by 42%, from under 120,000 to over 160,000, while the rest of the country together had a 9% decrease. On any given night, California has more than 160,000 homeless persons. 70% of them sleep in the unsheltered conditions. That means they sleep on sidewalks or in tents or vehicles. My name is Jialu Streeter. I'm a research scholar and the director of partnerships at the Stanford Institute for Economic Policy Research. We wanted to take a deep dive into homelessness because this is an area that poses significant challenges to Californians. The homelessness problem in California is very challenging for several reasons. About 70% of all homeless in California are unsheltered. In comparison, New York also has a large homeless population, but only 5% of New York's homeless are unsheltered. Most people are unsheltered because there is not shelter available to them. Uh, so it's not as though there's, you know, this huge vacancy rate in the shelters that people could go into. In California, you have encampments that have grown to hundreds of people. And when you have a situation like that, where these encampments have sort of brand names, you're more likely to sort of attract more street homelessness when you already have a certain kind of critical mass of it. The second challenge is the order of magnitude, especially in cities like San Francisco and LA. For example, in LA, over 60,000 people are homeless, and the vast majority of them sleep on the street. That's problematic. There is a scalability issue. When a community has a small number of homeless, they know how to bring that number to zero. Now we have 60,000 in LA. We may not have enough resources, and we may not have a scalable solution. California is not, it's not normal, the level of homelessness we have here. It's not like it's this way in every state. California is about 12% of the U.S. population, but we have 25% of the nation's homelessness and 50% of the nation's unsheltered homeless. So it, this is not normal, and it doesn't have to be this way, and it's because primarily of the extreme cost of housing here. There was no accountability message. There was no political imperative coming from the state. Um, and as a consequence, we're in a multi-decade housing crisis. The third challenge is that a significant proportion of the unsheltered homeless population have mental health or drug addiction challenges. It creates a vicious circle. They need proper medication. They need treatment. But being unsheltered makes it a lot harder for them to recover. The other unique thing about the homelessness problem in those two cities is, especially in San Francisco, the fraction of the population that is estimated to have serious mental illness or substance abuse problem is incredibly high. We have open drug scenes, which we euphemistically refer to as homeless encampments, which are places where people gather to buy, sell, and use very hard drugs. This is not marijuana or even alcohol anymore that we're talking about. One thing that separates California from the rest of the country is between 2014 and 2020, California not only has a substantial increase in homelessness, but its homeless population is growing faster and faster. New York also had an increase, but its homeless population has essentially plateaued in recent years. In most other cities and states, homelessness is either not a big problem or is declining. In Los Angeles County, on any given day, we have about 207 people who exit homelessness and go back into housing, and we have 227 people become homeless. And if you caught those numbers, what that means is we actually have an ever-increasing number of people becoming homeless in our county. Homeless populations have poorer health and are three times more likely to die than similarly aged general population. They are also more likely to be involved in crimes as either a victim or a suspect. 
Local residents and businesses are also impacted by the crisis. In surveys conducted by San Francisco Chamber of Commerce in 2019 and 2020, about 70 percent of San Francisco residents said the quality of life had declined, and 80 percent of them considered crime to have worsened, and roughly 88 percent saw homelessness as having worsened in recent years. Californians are angry, beyond angry. They're pissed. Uh, you know, the fact that you can walk into a store and steal $950 worth of merchandise with, with no consequences. You can go right out and do heroin and methamphetamine with the same no consequences. That's crazy. And we're seeing, again, that type of disorder pervade as we're seeing rising crime throughout California with no consequences for actions. As CEPR, we want to understand what's gone wrong and why homelessness seems to be such an intractable problem. Is this the result of failed policies and misguided efforts? Is homelessness too complex and intractable to solve in a state so large? Do we accept what's happening in our cities and live with the public health and safety problems associated with homelessness despite their negative impact on homeowners and business owners, as well as the homeless themselves? We're making this documentary to hear from various stakeholders, including policy insiders, local residents, and homeless individuals to delve into some of the issues driving the crisis and offer their ideas on how to address them. We will focus on some of the economic factors, including housing regulations, housing shortage, and unaffordability. We will see why, after spending billions of dollars, hundreds and thousands of people are still sleeping on the streets or in encampments. We examine the mental health and the drug addiction crisis and how they intertwine with homelessness in California. Housing is very expensive in San Francisco. It's incredibly expensive in LA. Uh, and the availability of very cheap housing is uh, just not there. According to Zillow, in 2022, the typical value of homes in San Francisco is over $1.5 million. It's about $1.4 million in San Jose and $950,000 in LA and San Diego. According to HUD, the U.S. Department of Housing and Urban Development, the median rent for a two-bedroom apartment is close to $3,500 in San Francisco County. In comparison, the national median rent is about $1,200. For example, over 50% of Californians are known, uh, of California renters are known what is uh, called rent burden, meaning they spend in excess of about a third of their family income on rent. So if you were to lose your job, say, in South Bend, um, you could live cheaply in South Bend because housing prices are so small, but in those two cities, it's incredibly, it's incredibly expensive. And so that safety net is not there. Income inequality and the, has, has imprinted itself on the rental housing market and really distorted that market such that there's been a real, a, a tremendous loss of affordable units, um, especially things that might have been kind of marginal, but where a lot of fragile uh, people with, you know, intermittent incomes, very low incomes with disabilities, they were able to hang on into some of these living situations that have basically disappeared. Some people blame California's lack of affordable housing on capitalism and high-tech companies and their well-paid employees. We have a capitalist economy that favors people who are making a lot of money and we are all doing quite well, you know, if we have investments in real estate, our money has increased. But for the people who are on fixed income, people who are on a minimum wage, they are left out of this economy, you know, and what are we going to do about them? Where did the people go? Where, where was the plan for those people? You know, now all the new young tech people are living in the, in the housing and working at Google and everybody's doing well, but complaining about the 10 cities that are right around their building. Well, those are not accidental. Every time you build something that is all cool and glass and steel, 
you are creating fallout because the people that you've displaced, of course, cannot afford to live there. In fact, they can't afford to live anywhere else. What Sam said is true, but it's only half of the story. Many cities in the world don't have street homelessness and encampments at the level seen in California. Why? Because their supply of housing has kept up with the demand. California, however, is well known for its regulations that block or slow down new housing. Starting in the 70s, we passed a slew of state and local laws that made it harder to build housing. At the local level, um, in the 70s and 80s, cities downzoned and basically banned multi-unit construction in the vast majority of California, allowing only for single-family homes in about 70% of California. In addition, uh, we restricted height limits. Um, we uh, just really just dramatically cut back on the ability to build more housing. At the state level, we passed uh, the California Environmental Quality Act, CEQA, in the early 70s, which was always intended to protect the environment. It, over time, has been applied aggressively toward stopping new housing, and cities adopted all sorts of long approval processes. And so over time, the, the, we kept layering all these new difficulties for building housing, and it's no wonder that we're building so little housing. Anyone can file a lawsuit under CEQA and even do so anonymously for a non-environmental purpose. In some cases, CEQA lawsuits were filed on behalf of newly formed associations. A lawsuit may allege any CEQA violation that was raised by any party at any time prior to agency approval. CEQA should never be able to stop building a new bus line that gets people out of their cars. It should not be able to stop infill development of housing. So when you're putting housing near jobs or near uh, public transportation, that's inherently climate friendly. CEQA should not have anything to say about slowing that down or stopping it. So CEQA is broken and needs to be fixed. Um, the politics of fixing it are very hard. Between the late 1960s and the early 1980s, California passed a series of housing laws, including the Housing Accountability Act, um, the State Density Bonus, the Housing Element Law, um, the Accessory Dwelling Unit Law, and a few others. And these are all good, important laws, um, but they had no teeth in them. And so cities would either ignore them um, or they would just go through an empty you know, meaningless process to, to, to comply in a way that didn't do anything. And so um, they were dead letters. Because we have a system of what's called local control, a lot of cities control their zoning and their municipalities. And part of it is a balance of public services, whether it be fire, police, uh, you know, storm drainage, you know, the, the cities are strapped in, in, in order to kind of deal with infrastructure needs and support services. So in some cases, housing is seen as being a burden to some jurisdictions because in some cases they may view it as housing is more expensive. It costs cities more money. Land use regulations and zoning that really um, are local tools to prevent building more housing um, and, and developing at the rate of the growth of those local those local communities from having purchased the property in 2012 and having gone to get the zone changed in 2013 and applying for the permit for the approval in 2013 and getting that um, approved in 2016 and then applying for the building permit by uh, mid 2017 we were allowed to uh, proceed with the demolition of the previous structures here until you know, and the construction took until 2020. It's agonizing, and, and, and the costs, I mean, there's no point where there's any reprieve, you know, if there's any change, every delay ends up causing um, estimates by contractors and subcontractors to increase, and by the time we were building, there were steel tariffs being put in, so all the steel had to be, you know, so, so yeah, a delay is not just time, it's the cost and it's the plan that, 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 that's in place that, that's being thrown off. I mean, a decade to build one building. You can't do it again. I mean, how long do you live? You know, do one more project and I'll be retired? No way. So uh, it's just an experience I did not enjoy and I, I don't plan to repeat. 
Everyone knows the term NIMBY, not in my backyard. Um, I like to refer to it as banana, build absolutely nothing anywhere near anybody. Over the years, there's been many creative ways to stop development, even if it's good development. And so um, having, you know, like a bill like SB 35 that Senator Weiner proposed and, and was able to get through allowed for certainty so that we didn't have to have discretionary hearings. So in other words, neighbors, you know, because oftentimes people inflame their perspectives. So they send out leaflets or big, you know, next door announcements that the world's going to fall apart because this new housing development's coming in. And so every neighbor comes out and says, no, no, no. The town of Woodside, um, which didn't want to have duplexes or fourplexes, the town of Woodside said, we're, we're, we're exempt from SB9 because, you know, gosh, the California, the California mountain line is here. Um, and there are endangered species exemptions within SB9. Now, you might want to ask yourself, it turns out, so I have friends who live in the town of Woodside, but this gives you a, a sense of how powerful NIMBY is. And in terms of the politics of it, it tends to be right smack dab in the middle of progressives who do not want more density in their neighborhood. That may or may not be legal. I'm not actually, literally, I'm not in a position to judge that. But look, I think we all know what their motivation is, right? I, with respect, I don't see them as huge champions of mountain lions, right? They're against housing. Now, whether they've done something that's legal or illegal is for the lawyers to work out. But we know what the motivation is there. So you've got a handful of cities that are doing the wrong thing on purpose mm -hmm. and they know what they're doing. Yeah. And our message is we're watching and we're going to take steps to ensure that you build housing. Because when Woodside doesn't build housing, it makes San Francisco's housing crisis worse. So now all of those laws are much stronger. Cities can't ignore them anymore. And we've given a lot of enforcement power to the Attorney General and to the Housing and Community Development Department, H HCD, our housing agency. They have more tools to um, crack down on cities that are violating the law, either to work with those cities to help them comply, or when you have bad actors that are just that don't want to comply to force them to comply through penalties through litigation so we've really um, put a lot more teeth uh, and accountability into our housing laws many expensive cities in the world like new york city boston tokyo and hong kong all have a mature and efficient public transportation system in California, however, public transportation is less developed. People working in the city are forced to either pay high rent or endure long commuting hours. The number of people with one-way commutes of 90 minutes or more, the so-called super commuters, doubled in San Francisco and some counties in the Bay Area between 2009 and 2017. If there was this transportation infrastructure, like there is, for example, in New York City, where the, the metro is very cheap, it runs everywhere, it runs frequently, uh, you can live 30, 40 miles away and take the subway in, right? We don't have that infrastructure. Um, uh, the BART system, the Caltrain system, it doesn't go as far, and, it, and it's, it's really priced um, you know, our, 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 our clients spend so much on old cars um, and clog up the freeways um, because public transportation just isn't that convenient here. Voters at some point willing to trust government and willing to buy into bond issues. In 2008, we bought into a bond issue for high-speed rail. That high-speed rail could have been so successful if it was set up around areas such as San Francisco, Silicon Valley, Los Angeles. The challenges of going through CEQA has made it impossible for the, for the state to get the kind of roadway easements that they needed, um, kind of figuring out how to get through some of the most challenging terrains and mountains has been really hard for the train to get from San Francisco to LA easily. But of course, what we're doing now is connecting Bakersfield to, Mer to Merced. Nothing against people living in Bakersfield and Merced, but the social value of creating the high speed and accessible transit to the very expensive locations from areas where people can afford to live, um, that would have been huge. And so we can do that, but we just we have to we have to take the first step. And again, 
sadly nobody's talking about that. Infrastructure projects are very political because it's going through things like people's ag farms, you know, and they're buying land and they're changing the way land is being used. I think it's wrought with really difficult challenges around. I think the, the route was a complete political compromise. You know, where can they buy it? How can they buy it? What land's available? And, um, you know, as a result, it's not ideal. There has long been disputes between shelter first and housing first. Shelter first, or better known as the linear staircase model, was the practice of the day before the turn of the century. The basic idea is shelter is a basic human right and should be provided to all homeless. Later, when the person was deemed housing ready, would he or she be provided with housing? The criteria would include receiving drug treatment, mental health treatment, going back to labor force, and being a good neighbor. However, in the 1990s and early 2000s, some people running homeless shelters realized that this model was not perfect. Dr. Samson Barris proposed a new model, Housing First, which would provide chronically homeless persons with an apartment of their own without any prerequisites on psychiatric treatments or sobriety. I left the hospital and I started Pathways to Housing, a nonprofit organization. I got a fund, uh, I got a grant from the State Office of Mental Health. And I said, I'm going to house people who are severely mentally ill going in and out of Bellevue, and I'm going to put them in an apartment of their own with support services. And people said, uh, you know, that's kind of crazy, you know. It's like people need supervision, you need a group home, you know. I said, well, there's lots of group homes and, you know, there's lots of all of those programs. This group of people does not want to go there. They want a place of their own. It, it, I mean, people were very clear. It's like, I'll, I'll stay on the street rather than go to these places where I have to comply with all these uh, different uh, things. I have to be sober. I have to take medication. I have to promise to go to therapy. I have to go to bed at a certain time, wake up at a certain time. And this is, was okay for a lot of people. Dr. Sam Sambaris published a number of widely cited research articles in the early 2000s based on his practice of the housing first model. He was hailed as the man who solved homelessness and housing first model gained enormous popularity among academics and policymakers. When I was in Washington, we were promoting, in the Bush administration, we promoted housing first. It was controversial to some people because they thought, how could the Bush administration be identified with the idea of placing homeless people in housing right away? There is a kind of follow the money type of aspect to the housing first question. The federal government, which is a significant source of funding for homeless programs, um, you know, essentially requires housing first. There are there are people in the home who got into the homeless services business over the last, let's say, 20 years you find far more of them in line with Housing First because in order to finance programs, you kind of have to be on line with it. What HUD did is they didn't require applicants to adopt Housing First in order to receive funding. What they did was they prioritized the point system of scoring applications so that it would be, it'd be really difficult to score high and not demonstrate that you've adopted a housing first approach. So it's it's not necessarily a requirement, but for all intents and purposes, it is a requirement to get the funding, at least to score high enough to get the um, to get the higher levels of funding. In the 2000s, a significant shift began at the state and the local level with agencies and communities increasingly moving away from shelters and transitional housing strategies, and then instead moving toward housing first, focusing on building of permanent supportive housing. As San Francisco's mayor, Gavin Newsom adopted a 10-year plan in 2004, which called for eliminating emergency shelters. 
As a result, San Francisco's emergency shelter capacity froze between 2004 and 2014, while all the resources were poured into building permanent supportive housing. However, housing development was extremely slow. Between 2004 and 2014, San Francisco built 2,699 units of permanent supportive housing. The decision to stop building shelters in 2004 received wide support among experts. But in retrospect, many acknowledged it was a bad policy. Then Mayor Newsom said, we are no longer going to build homeless shelters. Um, we're going to put all of our money in permanent supportive housing. And I, amongst many, like applauded that. I'm like, yes, let's focus on the solutions. But what we all failed to think about in the 10 year plan to end chronic homelessness, they're like, well, there was 2000 chronically homeless people. So let's build 2000 units of permanent supportive housing. Well, that's smart, but nobody thought about the inflow and this stuff takes time. So I think what Mayor Lee and especially Mayor Bree did was a course corrected. So you got between 2002 and 2015, like hardly any shelters got opened. And we course corrected in 2016. Policy decisions that people make that are based on feelings and opposed, opposed to data have really long-term impacts that don't get seen for years. Today, San Francisco has gone back to building more shelters, trying to make up for what was lost during the 10-year plan period. Still, shelters only receive about 21% of the city's homelessness budget, while a lion's share goes into housing. What happened in San Francisco happened across California. In 2016, LA voters approved Proposition HHH, which authorized the city officials to issue up to $1.2 billion bonds with the aim of reducing homelessness by developing and remodeling permanent supportive housing. In 2020, the LA City Controller's Office issued an audit of how the Prop HHH money was spent and what they found was staggering. According to the controller's public report, projects in the primary Triple H pipeline are taking between three to six years to complete, with most set to open between 2023 and 2026, almost a decade after the passing of the proposition. As of 2021, five years after the passing of the proposition, only 14% of the projects have been completed a total of 1,142 apartments. Development costs are high and continue to rise. In 2021, the average per unit cost was almost 600,000. Some units are extremely expensive to build. 14% of the units exceeded $700,000. And at least one project is estimated to cost nearly $837,000 per unit. That price tag, $600,000 per apartment unit, is not an outlier in California. High cost of land, high cost of construction, specifically in an area like the Bay Area that's very urban, the, the land is more expensive um, and the, the cost of construction is higher. So roughly it does cost anywhere from 500,000 to $750,000 per unit to build affordable housing. I think that the shared housing model is the future and that uh, it's the only way, it's gonna be the number one program that's gonna be the engine of reducing homelessness in California, because we're not gonna build our way out of it. We didn't build our way out of it in New York City. I, I think that the people in the homelessness sector uh, and I apologize if this sounds critical, but, you know, I think there's a paternalism streak. There's also a bit of a denial about some of the capabilities of people and the ingenuity and, you know, uh, energy that people who are homeless can put into this situation. And they also seem to think that the only solution is an apartment by yourself. Spending billions of dollars on permanent supportive housing is only the first step. Because these housing units are permanent, governments need to pay for the operating costs forever. This raises a question. 
As we house more and more homeless individuals, are our governments able to pay for the ever-rising costs? With one-time dollars, um, you may be able to do something like um, purchase a building or renovate a building. And that is something that we're doing with the state dollars, like for example, with the Home Key program. But that does not give you the ongoing funding that you're gonna need to operate that building or to pay for the services for the clients who are gonna be housed in that building. Let's talk about like what it costs to actually provide permanent supportive housing in San Francisco. And that's housing for homeless people that has on-site support services, which many, many people you know need to stay housed successfully. That's, that costs closer to $3,000 a month. And why does it cost that? Because it's freaking expensive to live here. I would like somebody to find me a one bedroom apartment in San Francisco for $2,000. Like good luck, um, doesn't exist. That's a unicorn. There's like a range of like housing first programs that we have to look at. And again, San Francisco, unfortunately, we tend to think that's just permanent supportive housing, but it's not. Most people would agree that having a safe place to sleep is a human right. However, people differ largely on what that place should be. What's the solution? A uh, solution is making sure that we have every human being in San Francisco has a permanent, affordable house. You can't just give and everyone a house. You certainly can. No, you every, can't. Every human being has a right to housing. You're talking about a one-bedroom apartment? Yeah, you need For everyone. For anyone on the street should get a one-bedroom apartment. Housing is a human right. Shelter is not housing. We have more billionaires per capita in San Francisco than anywhere in the world. We have the resource. We're just not distributing them appropriately. But if we text them more, then they will leave, right? No, they will not, and I don't care. They can leave. We will live here and happily have a more diverse and beautiful city without the billionaires if they want to leave. We will take care of each other in a passionate and compassionate way. Prophecy has passed by the voters of San Francisco, which is giving us $400 million a year to spend on housing services. That's taking from the wealthy and giving to the poor. That's a good, that's the right direction to go. We need to do more of that. Like how much more? I feel like, you know, if you tax the rich even more, for, for example, people like Elon Musk, they're gone. And they bye bye. Have fun in space, Elon. I don't give a shit. I think shelter is a human right. That's what the United Nations actually is saying, by the way. I mean, the intention of that statement when they wrote that was not having a apartment unit in San Francisco is your human right. It was not that at all. In terms of technicalities, the biggest distinction between permanent supportive housing and transitional housing is, is the lease, which, which if you can get people in on a lease, now what's happening is the Fair Housing Act governs evictions, which is another objective of the Housing First advocates. Get more people covered under the civil rights entitlement of the Fair Housing Act so that fewer people can be evicted for things other than failure to pay rent, destruction of property, or criminal activity. Under Housing First, chronically homeless individuals, those who have been homeless for a long time and also have mental health or drug addiction problems are provided with permanent supportive housing. A key component of Housing First is that those permanent supportive housing should offer wraparound services, including mental health and drug addiction treatments. However, in practice, the model encounters many challenges besides the prohibitive costs of building housing. One challenge is that because services are offered, but participation is not required, people with mental illnesses or drug addiction may very well choose not to participate. Some of the disadvantages of the supportive housing program is that those treatments are optional and individuals with uh, severe uh, problems, severe mental illness, substance use problems, would in many cases find it hard to participate in those programs or be willing to participate in these programs without you know, a additional push or incentive to, to participate in those programs. And that's what leads to a very large proportion of people who are enrolled in permanent supportive housing programs to exit those programs and return to homelessness. So according to my data in Los Angeles County, between 10 to 20% 
of uh, individuals who start permanent supportive housing programs would eventually return to homelessness. The requirement is not on the participant. The requirement is on the provider. The provider is required to provide services to the participant, but there's no skin in the game for the participants. They have every opportunity to reject every service that is offered to them. Second, understanding this arrangement, if you're a provider, what kind of services would you provide? You would provide low cost services that don't impact your bottom line, your operational costs, if they're rejected. So the services are things like what I call drive-by case management or um, transportation services. When Housing First was originally proposed by Dr. Sam Sambaras in New York, he had an one-to-eight ratio between staff and clients on site. However, in practice, that ratio varies across different permanent supportive housing sites. Those teams called assertive community treatment teams or programs for assertive community treatment have a one to 10 caseload ratio, one to 10, you know, or less one to eight. If the person is also homeless and needs not only clinical, but needs housing. So you have to work with landlords and other neighbors and so on. But that's a reasonable caseload ratio for people who have severe mental illness. The biggest challenge that I had being a case manager was connecting people to services. Because one, first of all, my caseload was 40 people, okay? Which meant that uh, I could talk to a couple of people. So some people I would only talk to once a month, some people I would talk to once a week. It's, it's terrible, it, it, it's, it's malpractice. If you do it on the cheap and you're compromising program fidelity, this is where program fidelity is tied to outcomes. People think of housing first, they think there's a doctor and a psychiatrist on site, that's a joke, that does not happen. That's a bunch of crap. I'm sorry to be so direct. Maybe that happened 20 years ago in New York with the guy that founded Housing First because he himself was a therapist and everybody in his unit was struggling with mental illness. So he had a bunch of clinicians on, on board there. The reality is, is that it's usually a few case managers, some people with lived experience and recovery from addiction, maybe formerly homeless people that are trying to help out their brothers and sisters because they've been there and they know what it's like to have been on the street. Okay. And that's great, but it's not all these wraparound services that everybody promotes it to be, let's just be real. What we did for 20 years was we funded shelters to become multi-service social welfare healthcare organizations that essentially provided a low quality of service uh, by unlicensed professionals to people. Okay, so it's, it, that to me was the wrong direction. Housing first as a concept, as a principle, was a corrective to that, to say we should get people what they need with most, and what the homeless system can deliver is getting people into housing. But at the same time, yes, Housing First has also become ideological. Uh, and some people just are holding on to it in a narrow interpretation, you know, and that there can only be one way. When we know that, you know, there's a lot of diversity in the population and, and we have to figure out the solution for each person. While billions of dollars are spent on building a few thousand permanent supportive structures, so many people are still sleeping on the streets. L.A. County and San Francisco City have been reasonably hospitable to the homeless over time. They've allowed encampments. They've allowed people to live outside. Um, they didn't rouse them like, you know, say they did in New York City under Rudy Giuliani. So as a result, it, it, it encouraged some people to, uh, to migrate there. Um, so I think San Francisco has more migratory individuals that are coming in to live there. Certainly the weather helps in that situation. Um, so there might be some of that as well. The official data would tell you that about 30% of unsheltered people come from out of San Francisco County. I don't believe that that data is actually very accurate. At least 50% of the people in tents who uh, I spent a year and a half or a year engaging with every day when I was at HSUC uh, are not from San Francisco. But I think a lot of people are coming here uh, seeking drugs. Um, it's easy to get here, it's inexpensive. You go to the Tenderloin, however, 
and the demographic is different. You'll have a lot of young white kids that are on the street that are not from San Francisco. And I'm sorry to be so blunt. I'm just being honest. They come from Northern California. They come from Oregon and up as far north as Washington. Mainly, it's a regional magnet primarily for people that live like in Santa Rosa, that lived in Santa Rosa, Sacramento, you know, maybe Mendocino counties. They come from the Central Valley, Yuba City, uh, uh, Merced, uh, Fresno, and they come to San Francisco. They're not from here. They might be from California, but they're not natives of San Francisco. I want to stay here because the difference of the people that are here, I'm from New York, I'm from the Bronx. And New York, as you know, is the melting pot of the world. People are a lot ruder over there, but here, People of California, that laid back, easy California style. You got millionaires living next door. Oh, it's a community here. Yeah, it really is. You know, so many folks saying it's just housing first, etc. All of these, you know, buzzwords and nomenclature. But things were getting worse on the street. I'm very pro housing. We need to develop more housing in California. And the fact of the matter is, it's the most difficult state in the nation to build it because of so many rules and regulations that this legislature and governors have ignored. Uh, it's too difficult and it takes too long to build housing in California, period. So you can talk about housing first all you want, but if it takes you seven years to build something, uh, it's not going to work. Housing first and permanent supportive housing, in a way it's been so oversold that people realize you can't tell me that I'm not going to see any difference on the streets until every single person who's homeless has their own housing unit. Because I know what that means is that I'm just gonna be waiting forever. You need to tell me what you're gonna do about public disorder while we're waiting for all the housing to arrive. While all of that's happening, all these people are on the street waiting. Mm -hmm. On the street, using drugs, right? Because of all the trauma, the daily trauma that they're facing on the street, half of those people aren't going to be alive to realize that housing when it comes online. And that's where the real tragedy is occurring here in California. Even when the shelter space is available, some homeless choose the streets over shelters. Some homeless sleep in shelters at night, but go back to their tents during the day. Why would they do that? I think it was close to 60% of all unsheltered homeless people preferred a tent village over an actual congregate shelter. Not over other kinds of housing, but, but over a shelter. I'd rather stay here. Why? Oh, they have curfews, they restrict how much property you can have. They want to tell you when you're going to come in and out and everything like that, and I really don't need that. I know that shelters are, are, aren't are great. I know they have rules, like no weapons, most of the time no pets, sometimes they allow them now, and no drugs inside. But I promise you it's better than what's out there on the street waiting for you. I don't care what people say they're on the street, they've gotten used to it. I got used to living on the street. You rationalize it really quickly and you start meeting people out there and you think you have friends, those same friends will steal from you too because they're drug addicts like I was. People were, you know, living in an encampment and they were just doing, they were really like caught up in their substance use and they just needed to be close to their, to their dealer. And they didn't want to go into a place where they weren't going to be able to use safely. And, you know, we're worried about their own safety. Um, you know, you're in a hotel room, by yourself or in, even in housing by yourself, uh, you know, it, it's you're safer if you're with somebody else and you're with, with a group of people. Bridge Housing created this new metric, this new term that they called dual residency. So somebody has a bed inside the shelter and then they have a tent outside. And that's how the, they were able to show us that, you know, our resources were not being, you know, ill spent. And so for us, the residents, that's not what we were told or agreed to. So that was incredibly frustrating to hear that they had you know, created this new metric now to explain that people had you know, resources inside, but they still had tents outside. It was anywhere between 10 and 15 percent of the people who we engaged with were either housed in private housing that they told us about, or we were able to look them up in our in that, that data system I spoke about and to see that they were housed somewhere or they had shelter somewhere or they were in a SIP hotel or even in a safe sleeping site. I totally understand why people were doing that. But if you think about it, then it's costing the city like on both ends. Like we're having to try to resolve the situation of, you know, an unsafe encampment um, in, you know, in a public thoroughfare, public space, none of them excuse um, taking up a space in two places. That doesn't mean that I think it's okay for people to create chaos in urban 
neighborhoods. And I think, you know, if somebody's gotten to a point in their life where they're pooping in public, I mean, they're in pretty bad shape. People don't, and people don't like decide they want to poop in public um, for no, for no real reason. Um, you know, there's probably some substance use or mental health issues going on. Not okay to have a tent set up that's blocking a sidewalk during the day. You can't have a permanent campsite um, in a city, uh, you know, anywhere unless it's in an authorized area that's just not healthy and not good for anybody. You can't sleep in front of somebody's house, in front of somebody's business. We're not going to allow you to urinate and defecate in our public spaces, in our parks. You don't have a right to set up an unsanitary encampment in front of somebody's house or business. It's not who we are. But again, it's also saying uh, we're not going to allow uh, tent encampments uh, all over our cities and all of the, the harm that it does, not only to the individuals, but also to our, you know, our quality of life in our, in our neighborhoods. I mean, kids need to be able to walk safely to their schools without stepping over needles and feces. Most of my neighbors with small children have already left. And that's just because it's too much for their kids to walk by. People are voting with their feet. They're leaving. And so if we don't make some fundamental changes to how expensive it is to live here, if we don't make fundamental changes to our quality of life on the issues like homelessness and housing, we're going to see that exodus continue.